I'm Marion Dry, co-chair of Class Act HR 73. And it is my honor this evening to welcome you to a conversation on Russia's war on Ukraine with Evan Thomas, Mark Kantian, and Roger Meyerson. Tonight, Evan, Mark, and Roger will be in discussion for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience for another 25. Before we start, I want to give a huge thanks to these three HR 73 classmates. I reached out to them about 10 days ago and within 24 hours, they had all signed on. And particular thanks to Mark who said, let's do it now. I want to introduce our moderator, Evan Thomas, who is the author of 10 books, including John Paul Jones, Sea of Thunder, Being Nixon and First, all of which were New York Times bestsellers. Evan was a writer, editor, and correspondent for 33 years at Time and Newsweek magazines, including 10 years at Washington Bureau Chief at Newsweek, retiring in 2010 as editor-in-chief. He has appeared on many television shows, including Meet the Press, CBS News, uh, Morning Joe, and The Colbert Report. Evan has taught writing and journalism at Harvard and at Princeton, where he was Ferris Professor of Journalism. Mark Kansian is a senior advisor with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in their International Security Program. Before joining CSIS, he was at the Office of Management and Budget, where he was chief of the Force Structure and Investment Division, working on issues such as Department of Defense budget strategy, war funding and procurement programs, as well as nuclear weapons development and non-proliferation activities in the Department of Energy. Previously, he worked on, the, on force structure and acquisitions in the office of the Secretary of Defense and ran research and executive programs at the Harvard Kennedy School. In the military, Mark spent over three decades in the US Marine Corps, active in reserve, serving as an infantry, artillery, and civilian affairs, civil affairs officer, and on overseas tours in Vietnam, Desert Storm, and twice in Iraq. He is an adjunct faculty member at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. A prolific author, he has published over 40 articles on military operations, acquisition, budgets, and strategy, and received numerous writing awards. Finally, Roger Meyerson is the David L. Pearson Distinguished Service Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts at the University of Chicago. He is the author of Game Theory Analysis of Conflict and Probability Models for Economic Decisions, among many, many other publications. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the National Academy of Sciences. He was awarded the 2007 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in recognition of his contributions to mechanism design theory. I now welcome Evan Thomas to begin our conversation. So we're gonna talk about how we got into this mess and uh, what a mess it is and how to get out of this mess. But uh, before we do, I'm gonna ask Roger uh, first and then Mark, just to say a few words about their, their own personal perspectives on the Ukraine. Roger, yeah. why don't you start? Thanks. My first trip to Ukraine was in 2014, so I didn't know it before that, and I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian, but, I, but since then I've been there a, a number of times, generally talking about decentralization reforms uh, in, in times of peace, but it's a country that I care about a lot. And, and, but also I want to say that as, as a game theorist, I think about this, my, my methodology for, for, for analyzing situations like this is to try to look at the situation from all perspectives, and generally with an assumption that... Uh, that all parties to the conflict are largely motivated by natural human uh, motives uh, subject to the constraints of their information and strategic uh, limitations. Anyway, uh, so I try to look at it all sides, but I'm an American who's had some historic bias towards Ukraine because I've come to know and love the country. Mark? One thing I'd add is that you know this is a turning point in modern European history. It's really the end of the post-Cold War era. We don't know what's gonna come afterwards, but it's gonna be very different from what we've seen over the last uh, 25 years. Um, and unfortunately it could be a you know, much more, um, much tenser 
um, Europe and you know, maybe even a second Cold War, but it's certainly a, you know, a, a, a major uh, event that we're watching. Let's uh, start, take a step back here. There's an interesting <clears throat> argument uh, going on uh, between the so-called realists who say that we uh, brought this on by essentially uh, tra trapping Putin, uh, uh, by folding Eastern European countries into NATO and promising Ukraine could join NATO, that we, we made uh, Putin feel encircled in classic Russian fashion. And, and so in a, in a sense, we brought this on versus the view that, come on, uh, Russia is Russia, uh, it's actually a good thing <laughs> that we put uh, much of Eastern Europe into NATO because uh, at least they're protected by NATO uh, and that this was gonna happen anyways. And so uh, just to set the table here, uh, uh, Roger, why don't you t talk about this question? Are the, are the realists right or, or not? I know at least one, one of my colleagues at the University of Chicago is a famous realist who I think you may be characterizing his uh, perspective or, or things he said, but I think uh, that realist perspective needs to be moderated by saying, uh, we're talking about American professor, professors of political science, political science who are trying to speak to American policymakers and point out where they see American policymakers making errors, which is not necessarily to take the blame off of uh, Russian policymakers. What the realists today may be saying may be largely must be filtered through the fact that they think that it's most important to uncover the, the problems of American policymaking. But I think it's complicated. I, I put the two together in this way. I think the basic fact is that you since 1991, Ukraine's democracy has had a checkered history, but it's it's made gradual progress, uh, especially since 20, the 2014 Maidan uh, revolution of dignity. And the, the basic fact is that because Ukraine and Russia are close countries and culturally close, not just geographically close, the example of of a successful democracy in Ukraine is potentially very threatening to, uh, to Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, and, and his ability to control his country as an autocratic ruler. So uh, Putin, I believe, would be motivated to, to want to suppress Ukrainian democracy by manipulation or by force, regardless of anything that the United States and NATO did. However, the NATO issue is, is not irrelevant. It is, I believe, a real one because that's, that's not a, a, a goal. The goal of suppression of Ukrainian democracy for that reason is not something he could sell to the Russian people. It's very natural for the Russian people to be concerned about the possibility of Ukraine being part of a military alliance that would, to put it one way, uh, enable foreign forces like Americans and Germans to uh, freely locate within a day's drive of the battlefield of Stalingrad. When you put it that way, you can see how that could be a hot button issue in, in Russian politics. And in April 2008, the United States led NATO in, in expressing a opinion that Ukraine should someday join NATO. Uh, and that has given something that Putin could use to depict the actions of an independent Ukraine in joining NATO as an implicit threat to Russians, not just to his regime, but to the Russian nation. And that's been very useful for him and in, in mobilizing support. And without that, I'm not, I'm not sure that his personal preference for suppressing Ukrainian democracy would have worked. Mark, you can jump on in on this or we can get to right to the situation on the well, ground. Let, let, me just, let me just make a one quick observation, which is that um, on NATO expansion, which is that there was some debate in the 1990s when it first uh, began to expand and the first tranche came. And after that, there was really very little debate either about you know, the security uh, commitments that NATO was undertaking or what the Russian response might be. Um, so as a result, we brought in a lot of countries uh, thinking that, you know, sort of a larger NATO would be a better NATO, you know, it's a little like the UN, you know, it would increase European security, have everybody inside the tent. Um, and then, you know, one day we wake up and find out that Russia is very um, uh, opposed to this. And we've now made uh, security commitments in case of NATO to the Baltic countries, which are extremely vulnerable and, and now have said, as Roger pointed out, that Ukraine and Georgia, the country of Georgia, would also become members of NATO at some point, although we never really established a mechanism for that. I think Putin thought that this was all going to be over in about 48 hours. 
uh, you know, they would knock off the head of state, they would put in public government, they would run the show. Obviously, that didn't happen. Mark, you're an expert on things military. What the hell did happen? Well, your, your characterization is exactly correct. You know, the Russians uh, launched this, what was essentially a blitzkrieg, uh, with uh, shock and awe uh, at the beginning, you know, uh, missile strikes, air strikes to uh, intimidate the Ukrainian people. Well, of course, he had started by rattling his nuclear saber to put everybody on edge. Uh, then he had sent these uh, columns uh, racing down the road, trying to get to the center of cities and uh, get them uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. occupied before Ukrainian resistance could solidify. Uh, he attacked on four different axes in the north, northeast, east, and south, um, all with the notion, as you say, of um, getting the Ukrainian government to collapse. Uh, and his reading, in a sense, was not crazy. You know, if you polled the Ukrainian people, you know, they looked very divided. Uh, Zelensky was not very popular. Uh, but, you know, what happened, of course, is that under attack, the Ukrainians came together. Zelensky, you know, turned out to be a you know, magnificent wartime leader. Um, and the resistance, you know, uh, began to coalesce the Russian uh, units, which had been racing forward. Many of them were cut off and chewed up. And the arms that the United States and others had sent to the Ukrainians really made a big difference. We sent thousands and thousands of anti-tank weapons and you know, that helped blunt these Russian uh, attacks. So then the Russians turned to a more methodical set of uh, attacks you know, uh, using their firepower. And of course, we're seeing that in many uh, cities around Ukraine. They're still moving forward though very slowly uh, and using a lot of firepower. Yes, they're using firepower, but gee, I, I would have thought they would use more firepower. I would, I would have thought at this stage, three weeks in, they would be flattening not just buildings, but whole blocks about, you know, they, Putin flattened big chunks of Chechnya and, and Syria. They, they certainly were, I, I just don't understand why it hasn't been, it's been violent, but why it hasn't been even more violent, why it hasn't been even more of a massive attack. What, what's going on? Well, you know, that's an interesting question uh, uh, in the sense that most people are asking you, know, why is it this violent? Um, you know, I think there are probably two things, although, you know, we really are speculating. I mean, one is that that they are trying to focus their firepower, you know, and flattening cities doesn't really, um, you know, help a whole lot if you're facing an army that's you know, holding you off. And the other one is, I think that the the fact that what they're doing is being seen by the entire world, you know, with social media, you know, every rocket, every missile that lands in a city is recorded. Well, I think that's having an effect. And, uh, you know, the Russians, you know, in many ways have been really quite careful. I mean, in, in some ways, you know, for instance, there are demonstrations in, you know, uh, Ukrainian cities against Russian uh, uh, troops. And, you know, the Russians have, you know, for the most part, tried to ignore that. I mean, they have done some arrests, but uh, I think that the fact the world is watching really makes a big difference. Roger, do you think that Putin is holding back a su surprisingly good model for this war may be found in the Second Chechen War, which happened in, in Putin's first year as president, uh, where it had begun actually when he was prime minister. You know, <laughs> Chechnya is had a population in 2000 that's that's basically one hundredth of what the population of Ukraine is today, uh, and it took five months for the Russian army to to take the capital of Chechnya, Grozny. They utterly destroyed it. I understand. Uh, so that the, the the brutality of of the attack uh, was was immense, uh, but it took them a while. Uh, we're only three weeks into a war. Uh, so I, I, I uh, the story there was um, uh, it took five months for them to destroy Grozny, another couple of months to, to take the capital, and another couple of months to to end and open hostilities. And then there was about nine years of guerrilla war. And since then, uh, they've installed a local dictator to, to suppress dis any dissent in the population there. And uh, that's uh, that's obviously got to be a mo our, our best model of what Putin is expecting. Uh, although perhaps he was optimistic that since Ukraine is a flat country and, 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 and Chechnya had, had high mountains that are good for guerrilla warfare, that he might be able to make a quick blitzkrieg takeover and, uh, and that would be faster than uh, Chechnya. But... Uh, of course, Ukraine is vastly larger, and, and the number of troops going in is is only a small multiple of what they used in in the Second Chechen War. Of course, they're much better prepared. So, Mark, can the Ukrainians win? You know, I don't know how you de let's define what that means, but 
but can they win a military victory? I think it's unlikely that they're going to win a military victory in the sense that they defeat the Russians and drive them out of their country. The Russians have a lot of combat power and the Ukrainians, you know, really are tough on defense, but, uh, you know, their forces, the militias are probably aren't very good on offense. On the other hand, if they stall the Russians, uh, that may be all they need to do. You know, the Russians uh, need to win or they lose. Uh, and if they're stuck in a, you know, a war of attrition, uh, you know, they don't have the political support uh, uh, back home, you know, and they don't have the, the munitions to continue a long war. Uh, and, you know, that would, uh, um, you know, I think result in either the, you know, in the Russians making some sort of deal, uh, which you, you can sort of see coming together right now, you know, some sort of neutral uh, Ukraine. So the, the, fir the first Chechen war, by the way, is also a, uh, a model where, where, where Russian public opinion ultimately shut, shut it down and, and enabled the Chechens to live on for another uh, six, another five years or so on four or five years under under an autonomous government, but um, but I, th I think so. I I would look at this. I, I look at this as, as about communication because it, when there's a, when people are, when two sides are fighting, obviously both sides have an assessment that, uh, that that they have something that they hope to gain that's better than um, whatever the other side is offering, um, and. So communication is going on. The number one thing that's that's being communicated here is the people in Ukraine broadly have a huge majority that that, that is is determined to to maintain their independence uh, and the courage and the determination of 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 people in the population of Ukraine to um, uh, to defend their independence is the news. Uh, demonstrating that. And demonstrating that that can become a, with a, with appropriate weapons supplied by an, an indignant West that they can hold hold the Russians uh, off uh, ultimately makes this whole war something that that, that Putin should want to uh, settle and declare victory uh, rather than wait wait it out long enough to, for uh, the costs of it to become evident to his people even through censorship and lead to some demand for political change. That's what a, a what a total victory for Ukraine would look like as, uh, as opposed to a negotiated settlement, which we can hope would, would, would settle things before Putin is in danger of, of losing power, which could take a long time. What is the risk that uh, Putin is going to use uh, either a tactical nuclear weapon, uh, these one of these small weapons, there's an interesting story today that these weapons can actually be surprisingly small, or can bio, what's the risk of that? Is he tempted? Yeah. You know, a, a month ago, I would have said no. You know, there was there was no risk. You know, now um, I think that there is some. Um, I wouldn't put it very high. Well, looking first at the chemical uh, or chemical and biological, of course, there's been a lot of Russian disinformation uh, claiming that the United States is supporting Ukrainian chem and bio labs. They're working with pathogens and, uh, on uh, warfare uh, um, uh, capabilities, uh, and that's of course. You know, totally untrue. I mean, we are, we have worked with many labs around the world to safeguard uh, their uh, operations and to you know, help them remove dangerous um, um, activities. Um, so it's possible that they're um, laying the groundwork. Chemical weapons tend not to be very good against prepared troops, although it's not clear how prepared the Ukrainians are because you know they have the gas masks and the suits to uh, protect them. They can be devastating uh, against civilians, as we've seen in uh, Syria. With nuclear weapons, um, if you really want a battlefield advantage, you got to use a lot of them because military forces are spread out. So, you know, just dropping one isn't going to uh, do a lot. You're going to have to use a, uh, many of them if you want a battlefield advantage. Now, if you're just trying to send a political message uh, to intimidate, um, you know, one is fine. And of course, you know, that would be an immense change in the you know, global security environment since there hasn't been one. Um, detonated since you know 1945. We're having a lot of discussions about things like sending jet planes to the to the Ukrainian Air Force. Uh, there are limits that are being respected on 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 the West, and a use of nuclear weapons by Putin would would cause those limits to change. That's it's frightening because where the next limits are uh, in the in the, in the weapons that, that are being used below strategic nuclear weapons that could destroy global civilization is, is, is a question that is hard to discern. So, you know, the answer to which it's hard, it's hard to answer. 
Uh, there's no clear answer and that's frightening. Uh, so I don't think he'd do it because, but, but it's clear that there are responses that, uh, that the West would stop holding back on. Uh, there sure would be a Ukrainian Air, Fo Air Force the day after a, a, a tactical nuclear weapon was, was detonated by Russians on Ukrainian territory. There is overriding this, this, this concern about Putin himself, his, his mental stability. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of talk, you got to give him an off ramp. You have to give him a way out of this so he's not cornered. Talk to us about that, about, about Putin himself and, and, and whether he, we need to find some way or the Ukrainians need to find some way to get, give him a way out of this that would allow him to save face or, and the risk of, of trapping him. Talk to us about Putin's motivations here and his options. I mean, two things. First, of course, Putin really believes you know, what he's saying about trying to reinstitute uh, greater Russia, um, maybe reconstitute the Soviet Union or something like that, or even the, you know, the Russian empire. Uh, he's talked about that for decades and he clearly believes that. And that's why uh, one reason why he's gone into uh, Ukraine. Um, in terms of giving him an off ramp, you know, I think if we want a negotiated, if we want to have a ceasefire in a settlement, we're going to have to give Putin something, something that, you know, allows him to, you know, claim some success and bring his troops home. You know, right now, our position is basically he gives up go, and goes home. You know, for Putin, that's probably the end of his regime. Uh, so, you know, I, and uh, that's why Zelensky, I think, has offered essentially a neutral Ukraine, uh, a Ukraine maybe that has broken its ties with NATO, but remains independent and democratic. Do you think that he would take that? I think that they're getting to the point where they'll, they'll take it. You know, a week ago, 10 days ago, Putin had a conversation with uh, French President Macron. Um, and Macron was trying to explore something like that. Putin was adamant that he wanted military victory. That was 10 days ago. Uh, he hasn't made a whole lot of progress. And at some point, I think he will decide that that's a, that's a better deal than uh, going for military victory, which is you know, increasingly uh, remote. Roger, what do you think about that? In December 2014, I published in the Kiev Post a, uh, an op-ed that said that, that recommended uh, that um, a promise that Ukraine would never join NATO was worth any concession uh, to, 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 to get ter you know, a, a to get Ukraine's territorial integrity restored. That there was that that, that was a basically a giveaway because uh, it means something to to. It, Putin was able to use it to mobilize support in Russia, and the, without Ukraine being part of NATO, there are ways that the United States can can obviously the United States has the right to help Ukraine without it being a member of NATO, and it, you could even argue that we're obligated to do so under the 1994 Budapest Memorandum when they which we signed when they gave up their nuclear weapons to Russia so that Russia could have a, a regional nuclear monopoly, and that was not a threatening act to to to, uh, to Russia. It was it was it was supporting Russia, uh, but 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 uh, I, I think I, about Putin. I would say, uh, you know, obviously we nobody knows, but people who I know who know Putin, would, one thing I get from them is that a large part of what he tells his the lies he tells his people, he may actually believe some some large subset of that, and uh, uh, which means that he probably didn't understand. Uh, the determination of, of, of the Ukrainian people to maintain their independence. Uh, let, by the way, this is important about Putin. I want to say uh, my, my understanding is, is, yes, Ukraine was very divided uh, and, and often, you know, east, on east-west lines uh, in, the, in its uh, tw 2010 uh, uh, pr presidential elections and its 2005 presidential election. But by 2014 and, and, and by the 2019 presidential election, Ukraine does not look like a, uh, by 2019, Ukraine does not look like such a divided country. And while I've just admitted that, that since, since, um, since uh, the, the end, since 2014, I personally have said, Ukraine should just never join NATO. We should, shouldn't, we shouldn't even talk about it. That's but my stand. People in Ukraine have gone the opposite way. Once, once Russia took Crimea and started uh, it, its, its steady attacks on the Donbass, um, people in Ukraine got steadily more anti-Russian. And I think the deep divisions on, that, on, 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 on the Russian question uh, in Ukraine were disappearing because of Putin's aggression uh, in the years from 2014 to 2019, and, and, and in 2019, 
overwhelmingly in the National Assembly of, of Ukraine, almost everybody voted for a constitutional amendment that sp sp says joining the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Those words are in the constitution of Ukraine. They put in the constitution that Ukraine's government has a fundamental goal of joining the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And that was over, passed by, you know, basically everybody voted for it in the, uh, in, in the National Assembly, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine. And Putin didn't understand that, I think. And he didn't understand that he was causing it in some ways. Ukraine is a different country today than it was in 2014. It's not just the invasion that's changed it. It's, it's the original invasion of, 20, of 2014 that began a process. And Putin was causing it and obviously didn't understand that uh, because he, he's not, he, does, he discounts those things. He does, uh, he's not inclined to listen to the voices of the people. And he's inclined, maybe he really believes what he tells his people that his, his, his population, the protesting Ukrainians uh, uh, on the popular voices in Ukraine are just manipulated by the United States. If, if I'm hearing both of you right, and I want to make sure I, I am, I'm somewhat encouraged that maybe the Russians will be slowed down or stopped or halted or stymied, and there will be some kind of messy agreement that doesn't obviously involve Ukraine and joining NATO, but some kind of neutrality that includes some security for the Ukraine and that there's a way out of this mess. Am I hearing this right? Am I being too optimistic here? You know, that's certainly one possible outcome. And, and I think it's looking more probable, both, yes. you know, over time as, you know, both sides seem to talk about negotiations and as the battlefield, uh, um, you know, moves towards stalemate. Um, you know, it's not impossible that the Russians would still uh, prevail. Uh, I worry a lot about the situation in the East, for example, um, you know, or something could happen to Zelensky. I mean, it, it's, it's not impossible. Um, on the other hand, it's not impossible that the Russians would collapse at some point and you would have maybe regime change uh, in, in Russia. There's a wide variety of uh, possibilities. We just don't know, you know, what the future will bring. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned to the group before, uh, whatever happens, the historians will, will write that it was inevitable and we should have all seen. <laughs> well, that's true. The, the downside of a Russian military victory, what, what that really would, would mean in some sense, and, and I, I want to keep the focus on the people of Ukraine, first and foremost, what it really would mean is that the force of Russian firepower, overwhelming Russian firepower, over weeks and months, perhaps, uh, ultimately causes people in Ukraine to give up, to, to say, we want our independence. And we remember that the last time the Russians invaded after 28, after 1918, uh, within a decade and a half, the Kremlin was imposing a uh, collect, a, you know, a, a holodomor, the, the, the collectivization starvation, where roughly 10% of the population or, or more uh, starved to death in a country that's a breadbasket to the world. Uh, so they remember that, and that, that, that's another reason to resist. But that resistance can be worn down by, by, the, by the horrors of, of warfare endured over I don't know how long it takes, uh, but it's possible. If it does, what I, but the other side of it I need to point out is that the Russian military victory is an outcome that is good for Putin in that it uh, suppresses, utterly suppresses democracy in, 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 in Ukraine, but, but it's not good for Russia because it, it, it means a permanent disjunction between Russia and Russian, the Russian economy and, and Europe and, and the West. And that's going to make Russia dependent on China, frankly, and the prospect of a Russian military victory leading Russia to become, in the, in, in the longer term, basically a dependency on the People's Republic of China is certainly not what Putin had in mind in trying to make Russia great. Is it, so that brings us to the questions of, of sanctions and, and whether the economic pressure we're putting on can really make a difference and, 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 and make... Putin want to come to the negotiating table. What do you think about that? But both of you, Roger, why don't you take that first? I'm not a macroeconomist, so I, th I think more about you know the, the, the strategic decisions. That, but 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 macroeconomists I listen to seem to believe that uh, um, that these sanctions are going to be macroeconomically effective. And as I say, what, perhaps the most important point of it is uh, the Russian economy, uh, which is very sensitive to imports now. It's a very it's a very it's been a, it's but I think. Uh, more than a quarter of their their GDP is from imports and more uh, uh, and, and exports. The, the foreign trade is, is important in, in important sectors. They're going to suffer. 
and they are going to become more dependent on China as, as a result. Um, that will be, that's, that's gonna itself have strategic implications. What do the Chinese wanna do with their influence? Uh, Russians need, in the, and the Kremlin needs to contemplate what, what, does, what do the Chinese then demand, for example, about the development of Siberia that, that looks different from what the Russians would have liked the development of Siberia to be when, 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 when the Chinese understand that the regime in the Kremlin is utterly dependent on Beijing? Um, that's a good question, and that's something that they're going to have to look at after a mil the military victory. Uh, but, um, but ultimately, in the near term, what drives Putin to the table is the, is, is the defense of Ukraine. Uh, it, 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 the, the sanctions can't be as, uh, as decisive in, in, in the coming weeks or months uh, or a few months as uh, what can be achieved by the courage and frankly, the sacrifices of Ukrainians who are willing to fight for their country. Mark, what do you th think about that? And also talk to us a little bit more with a little more granular about what kind of weapons the Ukrainians need to have, will get from us or from others to, to stop the Russians. Sure. Um, uh, j just on the question of sanctions, which I defer to Roger since he's the economist, um, but one striking thing is the, the secondary effects of the uh, sanctions. So it's not just uh, the economics, you're seeing uh, sports associations, you're seeing businesses, you're seeing a wide variety of private uh, organizations uh, pulling out of Russia, uh, excluding Russia, and, you know, so that it's, its isolation is gonna be much more than just the you know, uh, executive orders uh, that the president has uh, signed. Uh, in terms of weapons and what we've been providing to the Ukrainians, uh, we, uh, we've been providing a, a tremendous amount. We've been providing them aid since 2014, although that's been ramping up uh, over time. You know, the president just announced another 800 million uh, this morning or at noon. Um, mostly we've been giving them uh, anti-tank weapons, you know, the, the infamous javelins, but there are also a variety of other uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, anti-air missiles, uh, the stingers that people have heard a lot about. Um, and a lot of munitions and you know the you know the, the supplies of war you know night vision goggles and um, you know variety of other um, um, you know sort of a, um, accessories uh, and those are tremendously important because modern warfare chews up a lot of supplies and equipment and you need to get a continuous uh, flow of that if you're going to keep your forces in the field and operating effectively you know a lot of people have asked about. Uh, you know, what more we might do, you know, we're really sort of limited because, uh, you know, we can't give them some system that they've never seen before. You know, I've, I've seen people suggest, you know, we should give them Patriots, you know, which is, uh, you know, our medium, um, medium ranged uh, anti-air, anti-cruise missile uh, system. The problem is that it would take two years for them to, you know, train people up and get the logistics pipeline uh, operating that would keep the system working. We have to give them things either that are relatively easy to learn how to use, like the javelin and the stinger or that they already use um, and that's of course you know the discussion about uh, you know the the mig-29s from um, Poland we can we can talk more about that the administration's uh, position is that we would give them uh, ground-based uh, air defenses the stingers and I think there's talk about giving them some, what are called s-300s which is sort of a medium range uh, Soviet system that the Ukrainians already operate in some of the Eastern European countries um, have. And, you know, and that sets up sort of a, uh, you know, a bank shot, if you will. Uh, you know, the, our Eastern, Eastern European allies give their old Soviet systems to the Ukrainians who can use them, and then we give them more modern systems uh, that they can use. I've been hearing reports that, that observations that, that except for the, the air attack in Western Ukraine in the last couple of days, most of the horrific destruction that's going on in Ukrainian cities is coming from ground-based um, missiles and, and artillery. Uh, and, and so in some sense, this question of whether the control of the, the whether the, the Russians don't, maybe the Russians don't have control of the skies, maybe the Ukrainians with whatever they've got in terms of uh, the aircraft and, and, their, and their limited aircraft that they have, um, have sufficient control to prevent the Russians from using air superiority, or what's going on? This is being, um, you know, debated in the national security community. You know, where is Russian air power? Uh, because the Ukrainians still have, you know, still have some uh, jets operating. Not very many. Uh, apparently, they're doing about ten sorties uh, a day. The Russians are doing about two hundred. 
uh, but they still have their air defense operating and the Russians are losing aircraft. And for the first week or so, they barely used their air force. And that had everyone scratching their heads. You know, the way the United States does these things is on the first day, we hammer right. the air defenses, take out their air force, take out their air defense. And so that by, you know, day three, you know, we have control of the air and pretty much uh, a monopoly there. But your other point about most of the destruction being caused by ground-based systems, missiles and artillery is absolutely uh, correct. You know, the explosions you're seeing on TV, the videos, those, those are mostly artillery and missiles. And what that means is that a no-fly zone wouldn't help all that much because those explosions would still be occurring. But is it possible that Putin is somehow holding back? I, for instance, I don't understand why Putin hasn't tried harder to kill Zelensky. Who's saying he hasn't tried hard? I don't know. It's a question. <laughs> no, the reason I say that is that, you know, I mean, Zelensky said that there had been, you know, I don't know, half a dozen attempts on his life. So, uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll take him at his word and, you know, that, that the Russian, it's not that the Russians wouldn't do anything like that. So I, I think that they have tried, they just haven't succeeded. Do they, I mean, they not have the kind of smart weapons that, you know, we are all watch these wars that the United States fought in the Middle East with all these smart bombs and smart weapons and all that. It doesn't seem like the Russians have that or not using it. I, I just, I sort of don't get it. This is this basic question. Why aren't they doing more? Uh, they do have precision munitions. They don't have as many as we do. Um, and it seems like they're holding some back. You know, I've heard people speculate that they really believe that NATO might attack them and therefore they need to hold back some of their, their you know, high-end munitions for that uh -huh. conflict. Um, so you see, you see some of them. Um, the problem, of course, with those munitions is targeting. You know, where is Zelensky? You know, if they knew where he was, they'd probably use some of these uh, munitions on him. But I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure he's, you know, moving around and uh, uh, you know, in places where it's hard to find. I was wondering whether when, when Putin was speaking openly about putting his nuclear forces on alert, whether that was, a res that could have been, just speculation, could have been a response to somebody in the Kremlin saying, you know, we're putting too much of our resources into the battle in Ukraine. We, we can't defend these other fronts. And, the, and Putin's re natural response to such advice from his, his, his inner circle might have been, well, 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 let's remind the world we have the nuclear weapons then. And, and, uh, and so it's a tell that he's feeling vulnerable. I, mean, I think that's I quite plausible, yeah. I, I couldn't tell whether that nuclear saber rattling was aimed at the broader, the threat of overall nuclear war or more of a tactical local thing, whether he was, he was re really threatening to use local nuclear, tactical nuclear weapons, or is it both, or is it neither? Well, yeah, remember when he, you know, made these threats, you know, first before the war began, he had these uh, nuclear exercises just to make everyone, you know, aware that he had these forces. And then in his speech, he, you know, rattled his saber and threatened oh. to use nuclear forces. And I think the purpose yeah. there was to keep NATO out and to make the point that, you know, if you enter Ukraine, I, you know, I might use these weapons, or at least I have these, these weapons that I could use. We're going to go back to, I'm sure, these war fighting questions in the, when we talk to our classmates. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about China, uh, who, you know, what's their role in all this? What do they get out of this? What, how's it good for them or how's it bad for them? And of course, ultimately, you know, what does this mean for Taiwan? Oh, I'm going to let Roger go first here. Oh, I... Obviously, you know, as I say, the possibility of Russia, the, the fact is, no matter what happens, Russia has suddenly become much more dependent on China. And the truth is, if you look at strategic uh, threats to, to Russia, uh, they have a lot more uh, that the, the Chinese want to take from them than, than, than what anybody in America or Western Europe wants to take from them. A Russia that's dependent on China is a Russia that has to uh, reorient the whole development of Siberia. Let me just say that also the, the world that follow in the world that follows a uh, a, a Russian victory, if that ha if that were to happen, when you think about all the people who are worse off, um, I, we can start imagining Taiwan wanting to get its own nuclear weapons. Uh, they're not at the top of the list, but 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 a world going for the from the post Cold War world to a world where. Uh, where, 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 it's, where, it's, where it's expected that, that big countries can just go conquer lesser countries that, that don't have the ability to resist, uh, the number of countries that are gonna want nuclear weapons in that world is gonna increase. And including some countries that aren't members of the UN, which I named Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think one of the things that has people concerned is you know, the non-proliferation um, aspects of this conflict. Because remember, uh, Ukraine had nuclear weapons um, and you know, gave them up as, you know, sort of part of the deal, we helped give them up. And then with 1994, there was this uh, declaration, which Roger and I have disagreed about. Uh, and, um, 
but you know, but one of the lessons I think that many countries have taken is that nuclear weapons are the ultimate guarantee of sovereignty. You know, North Koreans obviously believe that, and you know, others, you know, like the South Koreans or the uh, Taiwanese, might come to believe that also. Um, on the question of, of China, sort of on, from a military point of view, I, um, you know, if if Russia had succeeded in its blitzkrieg and taking over Ukraine in a couple of days, uh, you know, that would have been very dangerous for Taiwan, you know, because Russia, uh, uh, China might have seen that as, you know, you, you can get away with this. Uh, the fact that first that they're bogged down and victory is very uncertain, and the fact that the United that the world has reacted so strongly, you know, has to give China some uh, pause uh, about any, uh, you know, thinking about any uh, military operation against Taiwan. We're going to take start taking audience questions here. I'm going to look at my chat here. Uh, and uh, take some questions from, from our classmates. Here's one uh, on Biden uh, from a friend of ours. Uh, I was horrified to hear President Biden say that he was not about to start World War III. What do you think of the analogy comparing this statement to a comparable statement that could have been made by Chamberlain on September 1st, 1939? I'm gonna start by saying, I think World War III would be a very bad idea. Um, and I'm really disturbed about how many, I think, otherwise sensible people uh, seem to be very casual about the notion of a war with Russia and all the dangers of escalation. So I, I think what President Biden said was just right. You know, we do not have a treaty obligation to defend uh, Ukraine. Uh, a, a confrontation with Russia has immense uh, risks. Uh, and, and we're doing a lot to you know, help the Ukrainians uh, as it is. So I, I, I think that, you know, what the president's doing is, is just right. There's some confusion about what makes you strong, in quotes, uh, and, and there's some confusion that, that being willing to talk about doing terrible, violent things and say, oh, we wouldn't mind having a nuclear war. No, that, that somehow that makes you strong. No, uh, that makes you dangerous, and it often it, it, it's exactly the wrong thing to do. What these weapons are de are deterrents. We hope that all of our military capabilities are deterrents. Deterrence means you say we will not use them unless the, the as long as these conditions are satisfied. For nuclear weapons, these conditions are a lot of conditions, but uh, um, you know there, there's a wide scope under which we hope not to, we would not use nuclear weapons. But but there are some conditions where we would use nuclear weapons, and one of them is if somebody else started using them, you know, against us. Uh, and that's an important role of those nuclear weapons. Um, of our nuclear weapons. You want to be very clear about what you would use them and what the what your adversaries can do to avoid World War III. Uh, to so saying, you know, we're not going to start World War III as long as, you know, the Russians, you know, behave according to certain norms. And we never said that uh, that an invasion of Ukraine would cut, would start World War III. In fact, We've never said that an invasion of our NATO partners would cause would start World War III either. We have said that we will send soldiers to go and fight for them. And that leads to a very good question as to how 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 high up the weapons go below nuclear, we hope. Uh, but um, you don't want to just say, I would love to start a nuclear war. No, you don't want you don't want a leader who says that. That that is a dangerous in itself, and B. It's um, it scares your people into thinking. Well, if they're going to start a nuclear war anyway, why don't I uh, try to grab some territory first? Uh, yeah, no, deterrence. Let me, clear. Let me, let me add, yeah, clarity. sorry. Let me let me let me add one one last thought here, which is I, I've also heard people express the idea that we're going to have to fight Russia sooner or later, so we might as well just do it now. And what I would point out is that that you know we had a standoff during the Cold War. That's why it was a Cold War uh, for you know whatever it was fifty uh, plus years. Uh, and, and we never had a direct confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. It is possible, uh, you know, to have a, you know, a, a, a Cold War, a confrontation that doesn't become uh, hot. So a war with, the, with Russia is not inevitable. Back to Zelensky for a second. What, what would have to become true, or asked here by Fred Adair, what would have to become true for Putin to agree to terms that would leave Zelensky in power? Under, under what circumstances could Putin allow Zelensky to stay in power? I think that you'd have two circumstances. One is a military stalemate where the Russians are getting worn down. Uh, and the other one is some deal about um, Ukrainian neutrality, cutting its ties to NATO. That would give, you know, Putin something he can go home with and say, hey, we succeeded. You know, they're not going to be part of NATO. And, you know, we won. Yeah. And even though 
we would be giving away something that we weren't going to do anyway. Um, you know, that gives them something, uh, uh, the off ramp that we've talked about. Remember, Putin is capable of lying to his people. So there's lots of terms that he could construe as a victory and get away with it, at least in the short term Russian politics. But uh, but I, I agree that, that the number one thing that's going to induce him to to consider uh, a compromise settlement is um, is the, the the Ukrainian defense forces managing to hold the Russian advance at bay. As long, when Russian when he thinks Russian forces can advance, he's going to want to try to do that. But uh, the, I think there's good hope that that will stop. And then I think yeah, I think I think an agreement that you, that Ukraine would not join NATO. Uh, it would require a constitutional amendment. And by the way, we might have seen this morning a nice formula. And I, I, I really think it's important to, to call attention to, to the, the less discussed part of, 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 of Zelensky's speech this morning, where he proposed a new form of international military alliance. Uh, he called it U24 uh, um, United in Peace. Uh, a new, and, and, and I think that's, this is a vision for a post, a better post-war world that he's trying to develop, uh, of, of a new form of international guarantees against conquest of big of small countries by bigger countries, um, and if if this gets the international encouragement that it should, uh, one off ramp might be a, an amendment of the of the Ukrainian constitution to substitute U twenty four part you know uh, United in Peace Alliance for the words North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, and that could look like a, a victory for Zelensky at home and can look like a victory for Putin at his home. Uh, and, and that kind of win-win is what you, what you kind of want to find if you're going to have any hope of getting two armies to stop shooting at each other. Uh, would Ukraine have to give up a little bit of the Ukraine to get a deal? You know, the unresolved pieces would be um, Crimea and the Donbass. And, you know, clearly the Russians aren't going to leave those two areas now. You know, maybe the Ukrainians can make a deal where, you know, they don't cede those, uh, but, you know, they don't, you know, they don't resolve them either. You know, you could get the Minsk process going again. It failed twice, but, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you could use that as a, as a fig leaf. Uh, you know, maybe they give up the Crimea, you know, since I don't think the Russians would ever give that back. Um, but uh, uh, it would be, I, I think it'd be hard for the Ukrainians to, to formally cede that. Although, you know, depending on how things are going on the battlefield, they might be willing to do it. Ukrainians know that they need military, the capability to receive military support from the West when, when, when Russia attacks. So nothing's going to work that, quote, neutralizes Ukraine in no sense of, 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 of denying it arms. That is the Munich Agreement, and, and everybody would understand that. But when you think about the importance of the Ukrainian people's will, that depends on their confidence that, they're all, that, that they know that they and their neighbors are, are, have, a, have a chance to fight together and, and some hope of winning. Uh, and that hope is important. Uh, any concession that causes the Ukrainian people to believe that now the, the, the wave of concessions has begun, uh, that's, that's dangerous. So a concession of territory, a territorial concession, or, and, and, and a neutralization, a pledge not to join NATO, for example, it's really important that the Ukrainian people feel that this is something that they can give that they can give up, and still uh, know that they have that they will be supported. And, and again, the Munich uh, 1938 analogy is important. The Czechs, the Czechoslovakians, were giving up important territory where all their defenses against Germany were, were, and they didn't get any 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 military support after after the, the agreement, and therefore they were totally destroyed. Uh, on those questions, Crimea has always been special in, in, in Ukraine. It's had special status. It was an exception. Um, and uh, if, the, if the Ukrainian people can find a way to, to renegotiate the, the, the boundaries there, I think that's not gonna affect the, the, the security of the country. And, uh, but uh, I, I don't, it, Ultimately, the politics inside Ukraine is absolutely vital to understanding whether there are territorial concessions that they can make on the, the two parts of Donetsk and Luhansk that, 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 you, that Putin has recognized as sovereign independent countries and the Crimean territory that, that, that the Russians have claimed is now Russian. Several of our classmates are asking, uh, is Putin going to survive this? What would it take to topple Putin? Military defeat. 
uh, would, I think, topple uh, Putin. You know, you look at Russian history and you know, rulers who lose wars, uh, you know, tend to have a very bad political future. Um, and military defeat would, would look like a, a protracted stalemate where the Russians took a lot of casualties and were making much uh, progress in a situation like that. You might have, you know, a, a worried military uh, officer corps um, and, uh, you know, some desperate oligarchs and, um, you know, a, a popular uh, unrest, you know, combining to push Putin out of power. It's not, it's not inconceivable. You know, Putin has climbed on the tiger and, uh, you know, it's going to be very hard to get off. I think um, it, 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 anything is possible, but I would warn, I personally would be very glad to see Putin fall, obviously. And I know I have some dear Russian friends who I think would be very glad to see Putin fall, uh, people I care about in Russia. But um, I think um, there's nothing more dangerous than people in Ukraine or the West deciding that the only outcome of this war that can be, quote, satisfactory is regime change in Russia, because that then means that Putin is fighting a war to defend Russia's political autonomy. Uh, the, 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 the political destiny of Russia has to be determined inside Russia, and we should be hoping for a military victory where the Ukrainians manage to defend their country successfully against the, this, this immensely powerful army that's attacking it. But um, we should try to restrain our, our, our enthusiasm for the hope of, of, of regime change in Russia and leave that to the Rus that question to people who are in Russia. Is there any chance that there are gonna be war crimes trials coming out of all this? I doubt it. Uh, uh, and, and that's not a moral judgment. I mean, that's a, really a political judgment that is, uh, you know, if we get some negotiated end to the war, uh, you know, which is, as we've said, you know, is, is certainly possible, you know, it's going to be very difficult to include in there, oh, by the way, we want to, you know, put all of you Russians on trial for war crimes uh, as part of this agreement. You know, you only can do that when you've, you know, defeated uh, the other side and, you know, you've basically taken them into custody. There will be demands for reparations from Russia. Um, I don't, I, the history of reparations in the 20th century is a bad one, and uh, we should not push that issue. Uh, the truth is, the people in Ukraine are fighting for their independence, for their freedom, but they are also fighting, they're, they're shedding their blood for the, a better world. If they win this war, we have a better world. If they lose this world, this war, we have a worse world. And, and, and I would suggest that the United States and Western Europe should be willing to pay, consider it a small price to help to, to, to the, the, the hundred or hundred or a couple hundred billion dollars to uh, pay for a reconstruction of uh, the destroyed part infrastructure and, and of, of Ukraine after 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 a, war, a successful settlement of the war, uh, that that's something that we should we should be willing to tax ourselves for, rather than fighting the war ourselves. Let me add on the question of war crimes that you know the investigations are not in vain, even if at the end of the war uh, there aren't actual trials, because what they serve to do is to highlight you know Russian uh, behavior, and that uh, then galvanizes the you know the, so the world community and Europe. Uh, you know, to look at Russia more realistically. Let's do, do a little bit of uh, domestic politics here. Uh, here's a question. Why is there so little discussion and blowback on Trump and the other right wingers who have sided with Putin in an attempt to make President Biden look like a weak president? How does, how does Trump fare in all this? Okay. Okay. Well, tr Trump clearly, I, I'll just say one word and then I'll turn it over to Roger. I know has strong opinions no. here. Um, uh, you know, I mean, Trump is sort of amusing in the sense that, you know, he starts off by, you know, complimenting Putin and then realizes just, you know, just how much pushback there was. And then and you can see that his more recent statements, you know, have been you know, more supportive of the uh, uh, Ukrainians. But, you know, I think that there's been tremendous pushback against um, uh, people on the right, uh, you know, who have, you know, seemed to side with Putin and Russia. Uh, and I'd also note that, you know, when the Congress voted, there were some on the far left also who uh, voted with the far right. It was very ironic that you you get the you know the two wings united uh, uh, against U.S. support for uh, Ukraine. I, let me say three things. By the way, one one is uh, I want Evan. You you got to answer this question too. But uh, the second, I I, I would beg uh, people um, to um, 
to, the, the talking points that, I, that I'm hearing from, from on Fox News are that Biden is, quote, weak, and that's why this is happening. And, and I certainly have heard the former president talk about uh, this wouldn't happen on his watch because he's tougher and, it, you know, and we have a weak president. Uh, you know, if you think Biden has done something that's weak and that, some, that a, a better policy would be, quote, stronger policy, it's, it should, we should be talking about what that policy is. It's not enough to just call your, your political opponent a weakling. You have to say, in what sense did he do something and, 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 and a Trump administration would have done it differently in this way? Uh, and don't tell me that our willingness to use nuclear weapons would be greater and, and that would scare Putin because uh, you know, if, if or, or if that is what he wants to say, then then he can't say that 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 that, that, that it's false for to, to accuse him of being somebody who could start World War III. Uh, you know, you, you, the, for deterrence, deterring Russia and Putin from an, an invasion requires clarity. Uh, you, it isn't something where you you know you want to tell people tell your adversaries don't do these bad things because we have a response that will make you sorry. Uh, you don't have to tell them the exact coordinates of where your attack is going to be, but you want to be clear about under what circumstances you would respond and, what, and, and in what, what measure and in what circumstances you wouldn't. So if, if, if there are people who feel that, that, that Biden is using the wrong strategy, it will not hurt anything in national security to stand up and say, this is what he's done wrong, and here's how to do it better. Uh, and I haven't heard that. Uh, the last thing I want to say was, was that there's been some question about why we're so polarized. And one of many, many theories is that the, pol the increasing polarization in American politics began after the end of the Cold War. And I think this year evidence is piling up that uh, maybe that's true, that among all the things like social media and, and real party real partisan realignment after the civil rights movement and other various structural things in American politics, uh, that the, there's nothing to help two, party, two parties be friendly adversaries and, and respect each other even while contesting for, for supreme power in our country through the electoral system. There's nothing like an external enemy to uh, encourage that kind of good behavior in a democracy. Do you think we're gonna get that good behavior? Maybe, uh, maybe this bad world is gonna, is gonna lead to better democracy in America. We'll see. It, it, it's, the, the, it, we're, just, we're just a few weeks into a new world, but the first, the first evidence seems to be Maybe Democrats and Republicans can learn to, to disagree about policy respectfully uh, without ac accusing each other of treason, in effect, uh, as long as there is a, uh, is, is a real enemy to worry about. Well, well, let's, let, me, let me just add yeah. one, th one thing on there, which sure. is that we have seen you know, uh, some bipartisanship in the last you know, couple of weeks that we haven't seen in a long time. The Zelensky speech this morning you know, or, uh, you know, got tremendous support from both sides, you know, all members of Congress uh, uh, applauding and supporting it, support to Ukraine, you know, the, uh, the appropriations have been uh, supported with a big bipartisan majority. So, I mean, that part is encouraging. Now, whether that will, you know, spread to other parts of our, uh, you know, political debates, you know, it's hard to say. There is some grant to have policy debates. Um, we haven't talked too much about it, but this idea of, you uh, 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 giving the Ukrainians uh, a MIGs, uh, you know, is that a non-starter? Uh, how about a, a, a airlift, a humanitarian airlift? Uh, how about, I don't know, um, yeah, I mean, is it not no-fly zone just out of the question? No-fly zone is out of the question. Uh, a humanitarian airlift would make sense if the Russians agree to it. Um, and the uh, MIGs, you know, are uh, a controversial issue in Washington. There are many people, including the administration, who argue that ground-based air defenses would be more effective, uh, less vulnerable. On the other hand, they've taken a certain uh, symbolic, um, um, you know, element as, uh, and there have been a variety of uh, members of Congress who have urged the president to, uh, you know, send them to Ukraine. It's another one of these bank shots, you know, that the Poles send their old Soviet equipment to the Ukrainians. We give the Poles new F-16s. You know, so the Poles are in better shape, the Ukrainians are better, in better shape, NATO's in better shape. Um, you know, I, I can't help but think that we're going to figure out a way to get those MiGs to uh, Ukraine, but we're not going to do it with a press conference. It's going to happen very quietly from some air base, you know, undisclosed air base 
and then one day people will wake up and find that the you know the Polish airfields are empty. We we can have a public political debate about it, but unfortunately, on the question of whether uh, Russia would take that as being an escalation that then it ha- feels it a need to respond to in order to deter such any further escalations uh, is a question that also involves the perceptions of people in Moscow, uh, and it's difficult. And and I agree with Mark that that. Uh, that the best way to avoid that is to uh, do it little by little in a sneaky way uh, and not, not let anybody notice it's happening until after it's all, all, all done in history. Uh, here's another question. Can China step in here and just force Putin to settle the conflict? Can, how, how heavy a hand can they have? The short answer, I don't think they can, but, the, the, but I, I think they, they want to be involved in the mediation and, and, and in a real sense, they should be. Um, I, I, I think uh, um, I'll say it's been frightening to me to hear people saying in American politics that that you know the, the real the real issue is is the rivalry between the United States and China. Um, the United States and China are much more powerful than each than 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 Russia. Um, but uh, why? Russia, why, why China and America can't live together in peaceful cooperation in this world uh, is a question that I think we shouldn't have decided is decided. Uh, it's, it's, it, I, I certainly hope that, uh, that, that we can try to not have a global superpower rivalry with China where we spend the rest of the 21st century uh, measuring every weapon system that they have and trying to to do twice it ourselves, and they and they do the same. They double everything we do, and we get back into the worst days of the of the old Cold War. That didn't do anybody any good in the 20th century, and I sure hope we can avoid that. Uh, Russia and uh, China and the United States have plenty of common interests, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, and, and China is important, but I don't, obviously they're not inclined. They, they benefit from Russia, uh, this Russian adventure in in a variety of ways, uh, but. Um, but they should, and, and it's not inappropriate to, to invite them to sit at a table. That's what I would suggest. Uh, but ultimately, this is between Ukraine and Russia. If I may add, Ukraine, Russia, and ultimately NATO and the United States, because they're going to have to agree. If, if it's going to be a neutral, you know, Ukraine uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, a demilitarized Ukraine. I, we should, I, I wish you wouldn't say demilitarized Ukraine because everybody knows that demilitarized Ukraine is a Ukraine. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, you're, and you're right, you're right. They, I, I, they're I, be very militarized Ukraine, I, like Switzerland is mili- militarized. Right, but, no, that's, right. that's right. On, on big yeah. questions. Where, uh, you, where Ukraine has, has broken its ties to NATO. Uh, right. The United States could veto Ukraine candidacy off. Portugal, any one member of, of, of NATO could take it off the table and, and Ukraine could take it off the table. Uh, I don't know that we have to cooperate in taking Ukrainian candidacy and NATO off the table. Um, anybody, any one, any one country that's that's in in NATO or that's Ukraine, can if they make a credible commitment, and that's the question, uh, is in a position to take this question off the table, uh, as I thought it should have been years ago. At the end of the day, is this going to what? What is this going to do to globalization? I mean, we've been through this incredible seventy years, really. Mm-hmm. Of the world becoming more more global, uh, are we going to retreat back into sort of two spheres, a Russia China sphere, and everybody else? Or what, what do you think? What's the world going to look like uh, in terms of its of a globalization when this is all played out? In a variety of ways, trade between allies, between strategic that is military allies, is getting easier. Is 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 becoming easier relative to to trade between countries that have a comparative advantage in trading and, and live on the same planet Earth. Uh, it's a good world economically when everybody trades with everybody. Uh, but the idea that in a, a pandemic, your friends will, will still share essential supplies more willingly than in your strategic adversaries. And that in a military confrontation, um, you might find trade cut off. Uh, all of those are reasons why Trade is going to become more localized, more regionalized, but but trade might increase between Europe and America and North America as a result, and decrease certainly is going to de- trade is certainly going to decrease between Russia and Europe and America. Though those the the, the 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 Atlantic bloc will trade less with Russia as a result, and we'll all be a little poorer for that. Um, 
In China? And of course, and for other reasons, trade with China is now becoming the, the, something that, that, that companies want to ensure their supply chains against a political problem that uh, is going to interrupt trade with China. And we got a lot of goods that looked very cheap to us. Uh, some, people lost, some people lost jobs producing those cheap goods, but a lot of consumers enjoyed buying very well-priced goods that were manufactured with high quality in China. And uh, we're going to want to do less of that when we know the supply chains between the United States and China can be interrupted in a variety of ways that could have to do with m military politics and uh, pandemic politics. And that's it. Maybe that's not a bad thing to have a world that, where there's continental redundancy, where, where each, each major continental block or, you know, or, uh, maintains a certain amount of redundant capability, capacity to produce essential goods and services. I think that NATO uh, will be revitalized by this experience. You know, certainly the Eastern European countries are very nervous. Um, you know, Germany has done this 180 degree turn from essentially appeasing Putin to uh, uh, pledging to remilitarize. Uh, so uh, you, regardless of what you see on the world economy, you're gonna see you know, a much more um, you know, uh, militarily uh, uh, active, you know, uh, built up militaries in uh, the NATO countries. Yeah. First in Ukraine and then in Europe, in America, Putin has succeeded in, in creating a kind of unity that uh, in opposition to, to his, his ambitions that he uh, professes to fear, uh, but he's, he's, he's really a principal author of its rise uh, in, in, in the countries that neighbor him to, to, to his West. So uh, we're just gonna uh, wrap up here. G give me, give us, uh, uh, Roger and Mark, give us your, your, your last thoughts on this. So are we, are you, I'm actually sort of encouraged by what I'm hearing here, considering what an unbelievably horrible thing this is. Uh, are, are you hopeful that we're going to come out of this in a better world, each of you? I think there's a real chance of it, and there's a real chance of a much worse world. Our fate really hinges on uh, the determination of people in Ukraine to defend themselves, to defend their freedom. Uh, I wish we would all take seriously uh, Zelensky's proposal of a structure for a better world, uh, because he's been, his is the country that's been let down. And I think just as uh, Winston Churchill had and uh, had a front, you know, the right to speak, you know, in in a uh, as 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 a leader in th in, in the conversation about uh, uh, how to restructure the international political system better after the after the Second World War. Uh, so the president of, of Ukraine uh, uh, is, is someone w the world should take seriously as a leader in thinking about how, how to better structure the world if the Ukrainians can manage to hold on. Um, and that our best hopes uh, are depend on his valor and we should take into account his ideas. Mark? Yeah, the, the only thing I want to add is just how uncertain things are. Uh, and, you know, we've all discussed about, you know, the wide variety of possible outcomes here and uh, I think it's a lesson to all of us about how contingent uh, history is. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we certainly hope for a good outcome, you know, a negotiated settlement that ends uh, the fighting uh, soon. But we've seen that there are possible, um, you know, use of uh, nuclear weapons, even or chemical uh, or uh, you know, Russian, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Russia prevailing. Uh, we didn't talk much about uh, insurgencies, and and I think that again, there's been a you know, there's been a little um, uh, uh, too uh, loose talk about an insurgency. I mean, it's insurgency, you know, the Russian, the uh, uh, Ukrainians are certainly determined to push the Russians out. A use, a insurgency might do that. It takes many years and it's yeah. immensely destructive. Uh, so, you know, a wide variety of possible uh, outcomes and reminds us again how contingent history is. Roger and Mark, thank you. And thanks to our friends in the class of 73 for a fascinating discussion. Good night. Thank you all very much. We, uh, this has been an extraordinary conversation. And just to give you an idea of how uh, much more people wanted to know, there were over 71 questions in the Q&A and more in the chat. So thank you, the three of you, for uh, helping us learn so much. 
Um, thanks also go to our production team, Jackie Swearingen, Therese Steiner, Katie Marinello, and Di Diana Labanchu, and to our videographer, Rick Brotman. Thank you so, so much for joining us for this important conversation this evening. And I will say, may there be peace and safety for the people of Ukraine and for all of us in this world. Good evening.